Hello and welcome to Audiobook Avenue, the ultimate destination for audiobook lovers. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on our latest uploads and never miss out on your next favorite audiobook. Thank you for choosing Audiobook Avenue. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 11 The Corsican Ogre at the sight of this agitation, Louis de Sweet pushed from him violently the table at which he was sitting. "'What ails you, Baron?' he exclaimed. "'You appear quite aghast. Has your uneasiness anything to do with what Monsieur de Blacasse has told me, and Monsieur de Villefort has just confirmed?' Monsieur Blacasse moved suddenly toward the Baron, but the fright of the courtier pleaded for the forbearance of the statesman, and— Besides, as matters were, it was much more to his advantage that the prefect of police should triumph over him than that he should humiliate the prefect. S sire stammered the baron. "'Well, what is it?' answered Louis de Suite. The minister of police, giving way to an impulse of despair, was about to throw himself at the feet of Louis, who retreated a step and frowned. "'Will you speak?' he said. "'Oh, sire, what a dreadful misfortune! I am indeed to be pitied. I can never forgive myself.' "'Monsieur,' said Louis de Sweet, "'I command you to speak.' "'Well, sire, the usurper left Elba on the 26th of February, and landed on the 1st of March.' "'And where? In Italy?' asked the king eagerly. I I "'In France, sire.' At a small port, near Antibes, in the Gulf of Juan, the usurper landed in France, near Antibes, in the Gulf of Juan, two hundred and fifty leagues from Paris, on the first of March, and you only acquired this information to-day, the fourth of March? Well, sir, what you tell me is impossible. You must have received a false report, or, or you have gone mad. Uh, alas, sire, it is but too true. Louis made a gesture of indescribable anger and alarm, and then drew himself up as if this sudden blow had struck him in the same moment, in heart and in countenance. "'In France!' he cried. "'The usurper in France!' "'And they did not watch over this man. Who knows? They, they were perhaps in league with him.' "'Oh, sire!' exclaimed the Duc de Blacasse. "'Monsieur d'André is not a man to be accused of treason, sire.' We have all been blind, and the minister of police has shared this general blindness, that is all. But, said Villefort, and then, suddenly checking himself, he was silent. Then he continued, Your pardon, sire, he said, bowing. My zeal carried me away. Will your majesty deign to excuse me? Speak, sir. Speak boldly, replied Louis. You alone forewarned us of the evil. Now try to aid us with the remedy. Sire, said Villefort, the usurper is detested in the south, and it seems to me that if he ventured into the south it would be easy to raise Languedoc and Provence against him. Yes, assuredly, replied the minister, but he is advancing by Gap and Cisteron. Advancing? He is advancing, said Louis de Suite. Is he then advancing on... Paris? The minister of police maintained a silence which was equivalent to a complete avowal. And Dauphine, sir, inquired the king of Villefort, do you think it's possible to rouse that as well as Provence? Sire, I am sorry to tell your majesty a cruel fact, but the feeling in Dauphine is quite the reverse of that in Provence or Languedoc. The mountaineers are Bonapartists, sire. Then, murmured Louis, he was well informed. How many men had he with him? I do not know, sire, answered the minister of police. What? You do not know? Have you neglected to obtain information on that point? Of course it is of no consequence, he added, with a withering smile. "'Sire, it, it was impossible to learn. "'The dispatch simply stated the fact of the landing "'and the route taken by the usurper. "'And how did this dispatch reach you?' inquired the king. "'The minister bowed his head while a deep color overspread his cheeks. "'He stammered out, 
by the telegraph, sire. Louis de Sweet advanced a step, and folded his arms over his chest, as Napoleon would have done. So then, he exclaimed, turning pale with anger, seven conjoined and allied armies overthrew that man. A miracle of heaven replaced me on the throne of my fathers after five and twenty years of exile. I have, during those five and twenty years, spared no pains to understand the people of France and the interests which were confided to me. And now, when I see the fruition of my wishes, almost within reach, the power I hold in my hands bursts and shatters me to atoms. Sire, it is a fatality, murmured the minister, feeling the pressure of the circumstances, however light a thing to destiny, was too much for any human strength to endure. What our enemies say of us, then, is true. We have learnt nothing, forgotten nothing. If I were betrayed as he was, I would console myself, but to be in the midst of persons elevated by myself to places of honor, who ought to watch over me more carefully than over themselves, for my fortune is theirs, before me they were nothing, after me they will be nothing, and perish miserably from incapacity, ineptitude, oh yes, sir, you are right, it is fatality." The minister quailed before this outburst of sarcasm. M. de Blacos wiped the moisture from his brow. Villefort smiled within himself, for he felt his increased importance. "'To fall,' continued King Louis, who at the first glance had sounded the abyss on which his monarchy hung suspended, "'to fall, and learn of that fall by telegraph.' Oh, I would rather mount the scaffold of my brother Louis says than thus descend the staircase at the Tuileries, driven away by ridicule. Ridicule, sir! Why, you know not its power in France, and yet you ought to know it. Sire, sire, murmured the minister, for pity's approach, Monsieur de Villefort, resumed the king, addressing the young man who— motionless and breathless, was listening to a conversation upon which depended the destiny of a kingdom, approach and tell monsieur that it is possible to know beforehand all that he has not known. Sire, it was really impossible to learn the secrets which that man concealed from all the world. Really impossible. Yes, that is a great word, sir. Unfortunately, there are great words, as there are great men. I have measured them. Really impossible for a minister who has an office, agents, spies, and fifteen hundred thousand francs for secret service money to know what is going on at sixty leagues from the coast of France. Well, then, see, here is a gentleman who had none of these resources at his disposal. A gentleman only a simple magistrate, who has learned more than you with all your police, and would have saved my crown if, like you, he had had the power of directing a telegraph. The look of the minister of police was turned with concentrated spite on Villefort, who bent his head in modest triumph. I do not mean that for you, Blacas, continued Louis de Suite. For if you have discovered nothing, at least you have had the good sense to persevere in your suspicions. Any other than yourself would have considered the disclosure of Monsieur de Villefort insignificant, or else dictated by venial ambition. These words were an allusion to the sentiments which the Minister of Police had uttered with so much confidence an hour before. Villefort understood the King's intent. Any other person would perhaps have been overcome by such an intoxicating draught of praise, but he feared to make for himself the mortal enemy of the police minister, although he saw that Dandre was irrevocably lost. In fact, the minister, who in the plenitude of his power had been unable to unearth Napoleon's secret, might in despair at his own downfall interrogate Dante's, and so lay bare the motives of Villefort's plot. 
Realizing this, Riavor came to the rescue of the crestfallen minister, instead of aiding to crush him. Sire, said Riavor, the suddenness of this event must prove to your majesty that the issue is in the hands of providence. What your majesty is pleased to attribute to me as profound perspicacity is simply owing to chance, and I have profited by that chance like a good and devoted servant, that's all. Do not attribute to me more than I deserve, sire. Then your majesty may never have occasion to recall the first opinion you may have been pleased to form of me. The minister of police thanked the young man by an eloquent look and Theophore understood that he had succeeded in his design, that is to say that, without forfeiting the gratitude of the king, he had made a friend of one whom, in case of necessity, he might rely. "'Tis well,' resumed the king. "'And now, gentlemen,' he continued, turning toward Monsieur de Bocasse and the minister of police, I have no further occasion for you, and you may retire. What now remains to do is in the department of the Minister of War. Fortunately, sire, said Monsieur de Blacasse, we can rely on the army. Your Majesty knows how every report confirms their loyalty and attachment. Do not mention reports, Duke, to me, for I know now what confidence to place in them. Yet, speaking of reports, Baron, what have you learned with regard to the affair in the Rue Saint-Jacques? The affair in the Rue Saint-Jacques? exclaimed Villefort, unable to repress an exclamation. Then, suddenly pausing, he added, Your pardon, sire, but my devotion to your majesty has made me forget not the respect that I have, for it is too deeply engraved in my heart, but the rules of etiquette. Go on, go on, sir, replied the king. You have to-day earned the right to make inquiries here. Sire, interposed the minister of police, I came a moment ago to give your majesty fresh information which I had obtained on this head, when your majesty's attention was attracted by the terrible event that has occurred in the gulf, and now these facts will cease to interest your majesty. On the contrary, sir, on the contrary, said Louis de Sweet. This affair seems to me to have a decided connection with that which occupies our attention, and the death of General Quesnel will, perhaps, put us on the direct track of a great internal conspiracy. At the name of General Quesnel, Villefort trembled. Everything points to the conclusion, sire, said the minister of police. That death was not the result of suicide, as we first believed, but of assassination. General Quesnel, it appears, has just left a Bonapartist club when he disappeared. An unknown person had been with him that morning, and had made an appointment with him in the Rue Saint-Jacques. Unfortunately, the general's valet, who was dressing his hair at the moment when the stranger entered, heard the street mentioned, but did not catch the number. As the police minister related this to the king, Villefort, who looked as if his very life hung on the speaker's lips, turned alternately red and pale. The king looked towards him. "'Do you not think with me, Monsieur de Villefort, that General Quesnel, whom they believed attached to the usurper, but who was really entirely devoted to me, has perished the victim of a Bonapartist ambush?' "'It is probable, sire,' replied Villefort. But is this all that is known? They are on the track of the man who appointed the meeting with him. On his track? said Villefort. Yes, the servant has given his description. He is a man of from fifty to fifty-two years of age, dark, with black eyes, covered with shaggy eyebrows, and a thick moustache. He was dressed in a blue frock coat, buttoned up to the chin, and he wore at his buttonhole a rosette of an officer of the Legion of Honor. Yesterday, a person exactly corresponding with this description was followed, but he was lost sight of at the corner of the Rue de la Jossienne and the Rue Coqueron. Villefort leaned on the back of an armchair, for, as the minister of police went on speaking, he felt his legs bend under him. But when he learned that the unknown had escaped the vigilance of the agent who followed him, he breathed again. 
continue to seek for this man, sir, said the king to the minister of police. For if, as I am all but convinced, General Quesnel, who would have been so useful to us at this moment, has been murdered, his assassins, Bonapartists or not, shall be cruelly punished. It required all of Villefort's coolness not to betray the terror with which this declaration of the king inspired him. How strange, continued the king with some asperity. The police think that they have disposed of the whole matter when they say a murder has been committed, and especially so when they can add, and we are on the track of the guilty persons. Sire, your majesty will, I trust, be amply satisfied on this point, at least. We shall see. I will no longer detain you, Monsieur de Villefort, for you must be fatigued after so long a journey. Go and rest. Of course, you stopped at your father's? A feeling of faintness came over Villefort. No, sire, he replied. I alighted at the Hotel de Madrid in the Rue de Touron. But you have seen him. "'Sire, I went straight to the Duc de Blacas. "'But you will see him, then?' "'I think not, sire.' "'Ah, I forgot,' said Louis, smiling in a manner which proved that all these questions were not made without a motive. "'I forgot that you and Mr. Noirtier were not on the best terms possible, "'and that is another sacrifice made to the royal cause, and for which you should be recompensed. Sir, the kindness your majesty deigns to evince toward me is a recompense which so far surpasses my utmost ambition that I have nothing more to ask for. Never mind, sir, we will not forget you. Make your mind easy. In the meanwhile, the king here detached the cross of the Legion of Honor, which he usually wore over his blue coat, near the cross of St. Louis, above the order of Notre-Dame du Mont Carmel and St. Lazare, and gave it to Villefort. In the meanwhile, take this cross. Sire, said Villefort, your majesty mistakes. This is an officer's cross. Ma foi, said Louis de Sweet, take it, such as it is, for I have not the time to procure you another blacasse. Let it be your care to see that the brevet is made out and sent to Monsieur de Villefort. Villefort's eyes were filled with tears of joy and pride. He took the cross and kissed it. And now, he said, may I inquire what are the orders with which your majesty deigns to honor me? Take what rest you require, and remember that if you are not able to serve me here in Paris, you may be of the greatest service to me and Marseille. Sire, reported Villefort, bowing, in an hour I shall have quitted Paris. Go, sir, said the king, and should I forget you, king's memories are short, do not be afraid to bring yourself to my recollection. Baron, send for the minister of war. Blacas, remain. Ah, sir, said the minister of police to Villefort, as they left the Tuileries. You entered by luck's door. Your fortune is made. Will it be long first, muttered Villefort, saluting the minister whose career was ended, and looking about him for a hackney coach. One passed at the moment which he hailed. He gave his address to the driver, and, springing on, threw himself on the seat, and gave loose to dreams of ambition. Ten minutes afterward, Villefort reached his hotel, ordered horses to be ready in two hours, and asked to have his breakfast brought to him. He was about to begin his repast when the sound of the bell rang sharp and loud. The valet opened the door, and Villefort heard someone speak his name. "'Who would know that I was here already?' said the young man. The valet entered. "'Well,' said Villefort, "'what is it? Who rang? Who asked for me?' A stranger who will not send in his name. A stranger who will not send in his name? What can he want with me? He wishes to speak to you. To me? Yes. Did he mention my name? Yes. What sort of a person is he? Why, sir, a man of about fifty. Short or tall? About your own height, sir. Dark or fair? Dark. Very dark, with black eyes, black hair, black eyebrows. And how dressed? asked Villefort quickly. 
in a blue frock coat, buttoned up close, decorated with the Legion of Honor. It is he, said Villefort, turning pale. Eh, hey, pardieu, said the individual, whose description we have twice given, entering the door. What a great deal of ceremony! Is it the custom in Marseilles for sons to keep their fathers waiting in their anterooms? Father, cried Villefort, then I was not deceived. I felt sure it must be you. Well, then, if you felt so sure, replied the newcomer, putting his cane in a corner and his hat on a chair, allow me to say, my dear Gerard, that it was not very filial of you to keep me waiting at the door. Leave us, Germain, said Villefort. The servant quitted the apartment with evident signs of astonishment. So ends chapter 11. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 12. Father and Son. Monsieur Noirtier, for it was indeed he who entered, looked after the servant until the door was closed, and then, fearing no doubt that he might be overheard in the antechamber, he opened the door again. Nor was that precaution useless, as appeared from the rapid retreat of Germain, who proved that he was not exempt from the sin which ruined our first parents. Monsieur Noirtier then took the trouble to close and bolt the antechamber door, then that of the bedchamber, and then extended his hand to Villefort, who had followed all his motions with surprise which he could not conceal. "'Well, now, my dear Gerard,' he said to the young man, with a very significant look, "'do you know you seem as if you were not very glad to see me?' "'My dear father,' said Villefort, "'I am, on the contrary, delighted, "'but I so little expected your visit that it has somewhat overcome me.' "'But, my dear fellow,' replied Monsieur Nautier, seating himself, I might say the same thing to you when you announce to me your wedding for the 28th of February, and on the 3rd of March you turn up here in Paris. And if I have come, my dear father, said Gerard, drawing closer to Monsieur Nautier, do not complain, for it is for you that I came, and my journey will be your salvation. Ah, indeed, said Monsieur Nautier, stretching himself out at his ease in the chair, really. Pray tell me all about it, for it must be interesting. Father, have you heard speak of a certain Bonapartist club in the Rue Saint-Jacques? Number 53, yes, I am vice-president. Father, your coolness makes me shudder. Why, my dear boy? When a man has been proscribed by the mountaineers, has escaped from Paris in a hay-cart, has been hunted over the plains of Bordeaux by Robespierre's bloodhounds, he becomes accustomed to most things. But go on. What about the club in the Rue Saint-Jacques? Why, they induced General Casnel to go there, and General Casnel, who quitted his own house at nine o'clock in the evening, was found the next day in the Seine. And who told you this fine story? The king himself. Well, then, in return for your story, continued Noirtier, I will tell you another. My dear father, I think I already know what you are about to tell me. Ah, you have heard of the landing of the emperor. Not so loud, father, I entreat of you, for your own sake as well as mine. Yes, I heard the news, and knew it even before you could, for three days ago I posted from Marseilles to Paris with all possible speed, half desperate at the enforced delay. Three days ago? You are crazy. Why, three days ago the emperor had not yet landed. No matter, I was aware of his intention. How did you know about it? By a letter addressed to you from the island of Elba to me, to you, and which I discovered in the pocket-book of the messenger. Had that letter fallen into the hands of another, you, my dear father, would probably, ere this, have been shot. Villefort's father laughed. Come, come, said he. Will the restoration adopt imperial methods so promptly? Shot, my dear boy, what an idea. Where is the letter you speak of? I know you too well to suppose you would allow such a thing to pass you. I burnt it for fear that even a fragment should remain, for that letter must have led to your condemnation. And the destruction of your future prospects, replied Nortier. 
Yes, I can easily comprehend that. But I have nothing to fear while I have you to protect me. I do better than that, sir. I save you. You do? Why, really? The thing comes more and more dramatic. Explain yourself. I must refer again to the club in the Rue Saint-Jacques. It appears that this club is rather a bore to the police. Why didn't they search more vigilantly? They would have found. They have not found. But they are on the track. Yes, that is the usual phrase. I'm quite familiar with it. When the police is at fault, it declares that it is on the track, and the government patiently awaits the day when it comes to say, with a sneaking air, that the track is lost. Yes, but they have found a corpse. The general has been killed, and in all countries they call that a murder. A murder, do you call it? Why, there is nothing to prove that the general was murdered. People are found every day in the Seine, having thrown themselves in, or having been drowned from not knowing how to swim. Father, you know very well that the general was not a man to drown himself in despair, and people do not bathe in the Seine in the month of January. No, no, do not be deceived. There was murder in every sense of the word. And who thus designated it? The king himself. The king? I thought he was a philosopher enough to allow that there was no murder in politics. In politics, my dear fellow, you know as well as I do, there are no men but ideas, no feelings but interests. In politics, we do not kill a man, we only remove an obstacle, that is all. Would you like to know how matters have progressed? Well, I will tell you. It was thought reliance might be placed in General Quesnel. He was recommended to us from the island of Elba. One of us went to him and invited him to the Rue Saint-Jacques, where he would find some friends. He came there, and the plan was unfolded to him for leaving Elba, the projected landing, etc. When he heard and comprehended all to the fullest extent, he replied that he was a royalist. Then all looked at each other. He was made to take an oath, and he did so, but with such an ill grace that it was really tempting Providence to swear him, and yet, in spite of that, the general was allowed to depart free, perfectly free. Yet he did not return home. What could that mean, my dear fellow, that on leaving us he lost his way? That's all. A murder? Really, Villefort. You surprise me. You, a deputy procurer, to have found an accusation on such bad premises. Did I ever say to you, when you were fulfilling your character as a royalist, and cut off the head of one of my party, My son, you have committed a murder? No, I said very well, sir. You have gained the victory. Tomorrow, perchance, it will be our turn. But, father, take care. When our turn comes, our revenge will be sweeping. I do not understand you. You rely on the usurper's return? We do. You are mistaken. He will not advance two leagues into the interior of France without being followed, tracked, and caught like a wild beast. My dear fellow, the emperor is at this moment on his way to Grenoble. On the 10th or 12th he will be at Lyon, and on the 20th or 25th at Paris. The people will rise. Yes, to go and meet him. He has but a handful of men with him, and armies will be dispatched against him. Yes, to escort him to the capital. Really, my dear Gerard, you are but a child. You think yourself well informed, because the telegraph has told you three days after the landing. The usurper has landed at Cannes with several men he has pursued. But where is he? What is he doing? You do not know at all. And in this way they will chase him to Paris without drawing a trigger. Grenoble and Lyon are faithful cities, and will oppose to him an impassable barrier. Grenoble will open her gates to him with enthusiasm. All Lyon will hasten to welcome him, believe me. We are as well informed as you, and our police are as good as your own. Would you like proof of it? Well. You wished to conceal your journey from me, and yet I knew of your arrival half an hour after you had passed the barrier. You gave your direction to no one but your postillion, yet I have your address, and in proof I am here, at the very instant you are going to sit at your table, 
Ring that, if you please, for a second knife, fork, and plate, and we will dine together. Indeed, replied Villefort, looking at his father with astonishment. You really do seem to be well informed. Nay, the thing is simple enough. You who are in power have only the means that money produces. We who are in expectation have those which devotion prompts. Devotion, said Villefort with a sneer. Yes, devotion, for that is, I believe, the phrase for hopeful ambition. And Villefort's father extended his hand to the bell-rope to summon the servant whom his son had not called. Villefort caught his arm. Wait, my dear father, said the young man. One word more. Say on. However stupid the royalist police may be, they do know one terrible thing. What is that? The description of the man who, on the morning of the day when General Quesnel disappeared, presented himself at his house. Oh, the admirable police have found that out, have they? And what may be that description? Dark complexion, hair, eyebrows, and whiskers, black, blue frock coat, buttoned up to the chin, rosette of an officer of the Legion of Honor in his buttonhole, a hat with a wide brim, and a cane. Ah, ah, that's it, is it? said Nortier. And why, then, have they not laid hands on him? Because yesterday, or the day before, they lost sight of him at the corner of the Rue Coqueron. Didn't I say that your police were good for nothing? Yes, but they may catch him yet. True, said Noirtier, looking carelessly around him. True. If this person were not on his guard, as he is, and he added with a smile, he will consequently make a few changes in his personal appearance. At these words he rose and put off his frock-coat and cravat, went towards a table on which lay his son's toilet articles, lathered his face, took a razor, and with a firm hand cut off the compromising whiskers. Theophore watched him with alarm, not devoid of admiration. His whiskers cut off, Duartier gave another turn to his hair, and took, instead of his black cravat, a colored neckerchief, which lay at the top of an open portmanteau, put on in lieu of his blue and high-buttoned frock-coat a coat of Villefort's of dark brown, and cut away in front, tried on before a glass with a narrow-brimmed hat of his son's, which appeared to fit him perfectly, and, leaving his cane in the corner where he had deposited it, took up a small bamboo switch, and cut the air with it once or twice, and walked about with that easy swagger which was one of his principal characteristics. "'Well,' he said, turning toward his wondering son, when the disguise was completed, "'well, do you think your police will recognize me now?' "'No, father,' stammered Villefort. "'At least, I hope not.' And now, my dear boy, continued Noirtier, I rely on your prudence to remove all the things which I leave in your care. Oh, rely on me, said Villefort. Yes, yes, and now I believe you are right, and that you have really saved my life. Be assured, I will return the favor hereafter. Villefort shook his head. You are not convinced yet. I hope at least that you may be mistaken. Shall you see the king again? Perhaps. Would you pass in his eyes for a prophet? Prophets of evil are not in favor at the court, father. True, but some day they do them justice, and supposing a second restoration, you would then pass for a great man. Well, what should I say to the king? Say this to him. Sire, you are deceived as to the feeling in France, as to the opinions of the towns, and the prejudices of the army. He whom in Paris you call the Corsican ogre, who at Nevers is styled the usurper, is already saluted as Bonaparte in Lyon, and Emperor in Grenoble. You think he is tracked, pursued, captured. He is advancing as rapidly as his own eagles. 
the soldiers you believe to be dying with hunger, worn out with fatigue, ready to desert, gather like atoms of snow about the rolling ball as it hastens forward. Sire, go, leave France to its real master, to him who acquired it, not by purchase, but by right of conquest. Go, sire, that you not incur any risk, for your adversary is powerful enough to show you mercy, but because it would be humiliating for a grandson of St. Louis to owe his life to a man of Arcola, Marengo, Austerlitz, tell him this, Gerard, or rather tell him nothing. Keep your journey a secret. Do not boast of what you have come to Paris to do or have done. Return with all speed. Enter Marseille at night, and your house by the back door, and there remain quiet, submissive, secret, and above all inoffensive, for this time, I swear to you, we shall act like powerful men who know their enemies. Go, my son, go, my dear Gerard, and by your obedience to my paternal orders, or, if you prefer it, friendly counsels, we will keep you in your place. This will be, answered Moitier with a smile, one means by which you may a second time save me. If the political balance should some day take another turn and cast you aloft while hurling me down. Adieu, my dear Gerard, and at your next journey alight at my door. Noirtier left the room when he had finished, with the same calmness that had characterized him during the whole of his remarkable and trying conversation. Villefort, pale and agitated, ran to the window, put aside the curtain, and saw him pass, cool and collected, by two or three ill-looking men at the corner of the street, who were there, perhaps, to arrest a man with black whiskers and a blue frock coat, and a hat with a broad brim. Villefort stood watching, breathless, until his father had disappeared at the Rue Boussy. Then he turned to the various articles he had left behind him, put the black cravat and blue frock coat at the bottom of the portmanteau, threw the hat into a dark closet, broke the cane into small bits, and flung it in the fire, put on his traveling cap, and, calling his valet, checked with a look the thousand questions he was ready to ask, paid the bill, sprang into his carriage, which was ready, learned at Lyon that Bonaparte had entered Grenoble, and, in the midst of the tumult which prevailed along the road, at length reached Marseilles, a prey to all the hopes and fears which enter into the heart of a man with ambition and its first successes. So ends chapter 12. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Duma. Chapter 13. The Hundred Days. Monsieur Noirtier was a true prophet, and things progressed rapidly, as he had predicted. Everyone knows the history of the famous return from Elba, a return which was unprecedented in the past, and will probably remain without a counterpart in the future. Louis the Sixteenth made but a faint attempt to parry this unexpected blow. The monarchy he had scarcely reconstructed tottered on its precarious foundation, and at a sign from the emperor the incongruous structure of ancient prejudices and new ideas fell to the ground. Villefort, therefore, gained nothing save the king's gratitude, which was rather likely to injure him at the present time, and the cross of the Legion of Honour, which he had the prudence not to wear, although M. de Blacas had duly forwarded the brevet. Napoleon would, doubtless, have deprived Villefort of his office had it not been for Noirtier, who was all-powerful at the court, and thus the Girondin of 93 and the senator of 1806 protected him who so lately had been his protector. All Villefort's influence barely enabled him to stifle the secret Dantes had so nearly divulged. The king's procurer alone was deprived of his office, being suspected of royalism. However, scarcely was the imperial power established, that is, scarcely had the emperor re-entered the Tuileries and begun to issue orders from the closet into which we have introduced our readers, he found on the table there Louis the Sixteenth's half-filled snuff-box. Scarcely had this occurred when Marseille began, in spite of the authorities, 
to rekindle the flames of civil war, always smoldering in the south, and it required but little to excite the populace to acts of far greater violence than the shouts and insults with which they assailed the royalists whenever they ventured abroad. Owing to this change, the worthy shipowner became at that moment, we will not say all-powerful because Morel was a prudent and rather a timid man, so much so that many of the most zealous partisans of Bonaparte accused him of moderation, but sufficiently influential to make a demand in favor of Dantes. Villefort retained his place, but his marriage was put off until a more favorable opportunity. If the emperor remained on the throne, Gerard required a different alliance to aid his career. If Louis the Sixteenth returned, the influence of Monsieur de Saint Méran, like his own, could be vastly increased, and the marriage be still more suitable. The deputy procureur was therefore the first magistrate of Marseille. When one morning his door opened and Monsieur Morel was announced, anyone else would have hastened to receive him. But Villefort was a man of ability, and he knew this would be a sign of weakness. He made Morel wait in the antechamber, although he had no one with him, for the simple reason that the king's procureur always makes one wait, and after passing a quarter of an hour in reading the papers, he ordered Monsieur Morel to be admitted. Morel expected Villefort would be dejected. He found him as he had found him six weeks before, calm firm and full of that glacial politeness, that most insurmountable barrier which separates the well-bred from the vulgar man. He had entered Villefort's office expecting that the magistrate would tremble at the sight of him. On the contrary, he felt a cold shudder all over him when he saw Villefort sitting there with his elbows on his desk and his head leaning on his hand. He stopped at the door Villefort gazed at him as if he had some difficulty in recognizing him. Then, after a brief interval during which the honest shipowner turned his hat in his hand, Monsieur Morel, I believe," said Villefort. "Yes, sir." "Come nearer," said the magistrate, with a patronizing wave of the hand, "and tell me to what circumstance I owe the honor of this visit." "Do you not guess, Monsieur?" Asked Morel, "Not in the least, but if I can serve you in any way, I shall be delighted." Everything depends on you. Explain yourself, pray. Monsieur said Morel, recovering his assurance as he proceeded. Do you recollect that a few days before the landing of His Majesty the Emperor, I came to intercede for a young man, the mate of my ship. Who was accused of being concerned in correspondence with the island of Elba? What was the other day a crime is today a title to favor. You then served Louis the Sixteenth, and you did not show any favor. It was your duty. Today you serve Napoleon, and you ought to protect him. It is equally your duty. I come therefore to ask what has become of him. Villefort, by a strong effort, sought to control himself. "What is his name?" said he. "Tell me his name." "Edmond Dantes." Villefort would probably have rather stood the opposite muzzle of a pistol at five and twenty paces than have heard this name spoken, but he did not blanch. "Dantes," repeated he. "Edmond Dantes." "Yes, Monsieur." Villefort opened a large register, then went to a table. From the table, turned to his registers, and then turning to Morel, "Are you quite sure you are not mistaken, Monsieur?" said he, in the most natural tone in the world. Had Morel been a more quick-sighted man or better versed in these matters, he would have been surprised at the king's procureur answering him on such a subject, instead of referring him to the governors of the prison or the prefect of the department. But Morel, disappointed in his expectations of exciting fear, was conscious only of the other's condescension. Villefort had calculated rightly. No, said Morel, I am not mistaken. I have known him for ten years, the last four of which he was in my service. Do not you recollect? I came about six weeks ago to plead for clemency, as I come today to plead for justice. You received me very coldly. 
Oh, the royalists were very severe with the Bonapartists in those days. Mazir returned with you for. I was then a royalist because I believed the Bourbons not only the heirs to the throne, but the chosen of the nation. The miraculous return of Napoleon has conquered me. The legitimate monarch is he who is loved by his people. That's right, cried Morel. I like to hear you speak thus, and I augur well for Edmund for him. Wait a moment, said Villefort, turning over the leaves of a register. I have it. A sailor who was about to marry a young Catalan girl. I recollect it now. It was a very serious charge. How so? You know that when he left here, he was taken to the Palais de Justice. Well? I made my report to the authorities at Paris, and a week after he was carried off. Carried off? said Morel. What can they have done with him? Oh, he has been taken to Fenestrels, to Pinerol, or to the St. Margaret Islands. Some fine morning he will return to take command of your vessel. Come when he will, it shall be kept for him. But how is it he is not already returned? It seems to me the first care of government should be to set at liberty those who have suffered for their adherence to it. Do not be too hasty, Monsieur Morel, replied Villefort. The order of imprisonment came from high authority, and the order for his liberation must proceed from the same source. And, as, as Napoleon has scarcely been reinstated a fortnight, the letters have not yet been forwarded. But, said Morel, is there no way of expediting all these formalities, of releasing him from arrest? There has been no arrest. How? It is sometimes essential to government to cause a man's disappearance without leaving any traces, so that no written forms or documents may defeat their wishes. It might be so under the Bourbons, but at present... It has always been so, my dear Morel, since the reign of Louis the Fourteenth. The Emperor is more strict in prison discipline than even Louis himself, and the number of prisoners whose names are not on the register is incalculable. Had Morel even any suspicions, so much kindness would have dispelled them. Well, Monsieur de Villefort, how would you advise me to act? asked he. Petition the minister. Oh, I know what that is. The minister receives two hundred petitions every day and does not read three. That is true, but he will read a petition countersigned and presented by me. And will you undertake to deliver it? With the greatest pleasure. Dantes was then guilty, and now he is innocent, and it is as much my duty to free him as it was to condemn him. Villefort thus forestalled any danger of an inquiry, which, however improbable it might be, if it did take place, would leave him defenceless. But how shall I address the minister? Sit down there, said Villefort, giving up his place to Morel, and write what I dictate. Will you be so good? Certainly. But lose no time. We have lost too much already. That is true. Only think what the poor fellow may even now be suffering. Villefort shuddered at the suggestion, but he had gone too far to draw back. Dantes must be crushed to gratify Villefort's ambition. Villefort dictated a petition in which, from an excellent intention, no doubt, Dante's patriotic services were exaggerated, and he was made out one of the most active agents of Napoleon's return. It was evident that, at the sight of this document, the minister would instantly release him. The petition finished, Villefort read it aloud. That will do, said he. Leave the rest to me. Will the petition go soon? Today. Countersigned by you? The best thing I can do will be to certify the truth of the contents of your petition. And, sitting down, Villefort wrote the certificate at the bottom. Dantes remained a prisoner and heard not the noise of the fall of Louis XVIII's throne or the still more tragic destruction of the empire. Twice during the hundred days had Morel renewed his demand, and twice had Villefort soothed him with promises. At last there was Waterloo, and Morel came no more. He had done all that was in his power, and any fresh attempt would only compromise him uselessly. Louis XVIII remounted the throne. Villefort, 
to whom Marseille had become filled with remorseful memories, sought and obtained the situation of King's Procurer at Toulouse, and a fortnight afterwards he married Mademoiselle de saint Maron, whose father now stood higher at court than ever. And so Dantes, after the hundred days and after Waterloo, remained in his dungeon, forgotten of earth and heaven. Danglars comprehended the full extent of the wretched fate that overwhelmed Dantes, and when Napoleon returned to France, he, after the manner of mediocre minds, deemed the coincidence a degree of providence. But when Napoleon returned to Paris, Danglars' heart failed him, and he lived in constant fear of Dante's return on a mission of vengeance. He therefore informed M. Morel of his wish to quit the sea, and obtained a recommendation from him to a Spanish merchant, into whose service he entered at the end of March, that is, ten or twelve days after Napoleon's return. He then left for Madrid and was heard no more of. Fernand understood nothing except that Dantes was absent. What had become of him he cared not to inquire. Only during the respite the absence of his rival afforded him, he reflected, partly on the means of deceiving Mercedes as to the cause of his absence, partly on plans of emigration and abduction, as from time to time he sat and motionless on the summit of Cape Faro, at the spot from whence Marseille and the Catalans are visible, watching for the apparition of a young and handsome man, who was for him also the messenger of vengeance. Fernand's mind was made up. He would shoot Dantes and then kill himself. But Fernand was mistaken. A man of his disposition never kills himself, for he constantly hopes. During this time, the Empire made its last conscription, and every man in France capable of bearing arms rushed to obey the summons of the emperor. Fernand departed with the rest, bearing with him the terrible thought that while he was away, his rival would perhaps return and marry Mercedes. Had Fernand really meant to kill himself, he would have done so when he parted from Mercedes. His devotion and the compassion he showed for her misfortunes produced the effect they always produce on noble minds. Mercedes had always had a sincere regard for Fernand, and this was now strengthened by gratitude. My brother, said she, as she placed his knapsack on his shoulders, be careful of yourself, for if you are killed, I shall be alone in this world. These words carried a ray of hope into Fernand's heart. Should Dantes not return, Mercedes might one day be his. Mercedes was left alone to face face with the vast plain that had never seemed so barren, and the sea that had never seemed so vast. Bathed in tears, she wandered about the Catalan village. Sometimes she stood mute and motionless as a statue, looking towards Marseille, at other times gazing on the sea, and debating as to whether it were not better to cast herself into the abyss of the ocean, and thus end her woes. It was not want of courage that prevented her putting this resolution into execution, but her religious feelings came to her aid and saved her. Caderousse was, like Fernand, enrolled in the army, but, being married and eight years older, he was merely sent to the frontier. Old Dantes, who was only sustained by hope, lost all hope and Napoleon's downfall. Five months after, he had been separated from his son, and almost at the hour of his arrest, he bequeathed his last in Mercedes' arms. M. Morel paid the expenses of his funeral, and a few small debts the old poor man had contracted. There was more than benevolence in this action. There was courage. The South was aflame, and to assist, even on his deathbed, the father of so dangerous a Bonapartist as Dantes was stigmatized as a crime. End of chapter 13 The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas Chapter 14 The Two Prisoners A year after Louis XVIII's restoration, a visit was made by the Inspector General of Prisons. Dantes in his cell heard the noise of preparation. Sounds that at the depth where he lay would have been inaudible to any but the ear of a prisoner, who could hear the splash of the drop of water that every hour fell from the roof of his dungeon. He guessed something uncommon was passing among the living, 
but he had so long ceased to have any intercourse with the world, that he looked upon himself as dead. The inspector visited, one after another, the cells and dungeons of several of the prisoners, whose good behaviour or stupidity recommended them to the clemency of the government. He inquired how they were fed, and if they had any request to make. The universal response was that the fare was detestable, and that they wanted to be set free. The inspector asked if they had anything else to ask for. They shook their heads. What could they desire beyond their liberty? The inspector turned smilingly to the governor. I do not know what reason government can assign for these useless visits. When you see one prisoner, you see all. Always the same thing. Ill-fed and innocent. Are there any others? Yes. The dangerous and mad prisoners are in the dungeons. Let us visit them, then, said the inspector with an air of fatigue. We must play the farce to the end. Let us see the dungeons. Let us first send for two soldiers, said the governor. The prisoner sometimes, through mere uneasiness of life, and in order to be sentenced to death, commit acts of useless violence, and you might fall a victim. Take all needful precautions, replied the inspector. Two soldiers were accordingly sent for, and the inspector descended a stairway, so foul, so humid, so dark, as to be loathsome to sight, smell, and respiration. Oh, cried the inspector, who can live here? A most dangerous conspirator, a man we are ordered to keep the most strict watch over, as he is daring and resolute. He is alone? Certainly. How long has he been there? Nearly a year. Was he placed here when he first arrived? No, not until he attempted to kill the turnkey, who took his food to him. To kill the turnkey? Yes, the very one who is lighting us. Is it not true, Antoine? Asked the governor. True enough, he wanted to kill me. Returned the turnkey. He must be mad, said the inspector. He is worse than that. He is a devil. Returned the turnkey. "'Shall I complain of him?' demanded the inspector. "'Oh, no, it is useless. Besides, he is almost mad now, and in another year he will be quite so.' "'So much the better for him. He will suffer less,' said the inspector. He was, as this remark shows, a man full of philanthropy, and in every way fit for his office. "'You are right, sir,' replied the governor and this remark proves that you have deeply considered the subject. Now we have in a dungeon about twenty feet distant, and to which you descended by another stair, an abbey, formerly leader of a party in Italy, who has been here since 1811, and in 1813 he went mad, and the change is astonishing. He used to weep, he now laughs, he grew thin, he now grows fat. You had better see him, for his madness is amusing." "'I will see them both,' returned the inspector. "'I must conscientiously perform my duty.' "'This was the inspector's first visit. "'He wished to display his authority. "'Let us visit this one first, added he. "'By all means,' replied the governor, "'and he signed to the turnkey to open the door. "'At the sound of the key turning in the lock "'and the creaking of the hinges,' Dantes, who was crouched in a corner of the dungeon, whence he could see the ray of light that came through a narrow iron grating above, raised his head. Seeing a stranger, escorted by two turnkeys, holding torches and accompanied by two soldiers, and to whom the governor spoke bareheaded, Dantes, who guessed the truth, and that the moment to address himself to the superior authorities was come, sprung forward with clasped hands. The soldiers interposed their bayonets, for they thought that he was about to attack the inspector, and the latter recoiled two or three steps. Dante saw that he was looked upon as dangerous. Then, infusing all the humility he possessed into his eyes and voice, he addressed the inspector, and sought to inspire him with pity. 
The inspector listened attentively, then, turning to the governor, observed, "'He will become religious. He is already more gentle. He is afraid and retreated before the bayonets. Madmen are not afraid of anything. I made some curious observations on this at Charenton. Then, turning to the prisoner, "'What is it you want?' said he. "'I want to know what crime I have committed, to be tried, and if I am guilty, to be shot, if innocent, to be set at liberty.' "'Are you well fed?' said the inspector. "'I believe so. I don't know. It's of no consequence. What matters really, not only to me, but to officers of justice and the king, is that an innocent man should languish in prison, the victim of an infamous denunciation, to die here cursing his executioners.' "'You are very humble to-day,' remarked the governor. "'You are not always so. The other day, for instance, when you tried to kill the turnkey.' "'It is true, sir, and I beg his pardon, for he has always been very good to me. But I was mad.' "'Are you not so any longer?' "'No. Captivity has subdued me. I have been here so long.' "'So long? When were you arrested, then?' asked the inspector. "'The 28th of February, 1815, at half-past two in the afternoon.' "'Today is the 30th of July, 1816.' "'Why, it is but seventeen months.' "'Only seventeen months?' replied Dantes. "'Oh, you do not know what is seventeen months in prison. Seventeen ages, rather, especially to a man who, like me, had arrived at the summit of his ambition, to a man who, like me, was on the point of marrying a woman he adored, who saw an honourable career opened before him, and who loses all in an instant.' who sees his prospects destroyed, and is ignorant of the fate of his affianced wife, and whether his aged father be living. Seventeen months' captivity to a sailor accustomed to the boundless ocean is a worse punishment than human crime ever merited. Have pity on me, then, and ask for me, not intelligence, but a trial, not pardon, but a verdict. A trial, sir, I only ask for that. That surely cannot be denied to one who is accused. "'We shall see,' said the inspector, turning to the governor. "'On my word, the poor devil touches me. "'You must show me the proofs against him.' "'Certainly, but you will find terrible charges.' "'Monsieur,' continued Dantes, "'I know it is not in your power to release me, "'but you can plead for me. "'You can have me tried, and that is all I ask.' Let me know my crime and the reason why I am condemned. Uncertainty is worse than all. Go on with the lights, said the inspector. Monsieur, cried Dantes, I can tell by your voice you are touched with pity. Tell me at least to hope. I cannot tell you that, replied the inspector. I can only promise to examine into your case. Oh, I am free, then I am saved. "'Who arrested you?' "'Monsieur Villefort. See him and hear what he says. "'Monsieur Villefort is no longer at Marseilles. He is now at Toulouse.' "'I am no longer surprised at my detention,' murmured Dantes, "'since my only protector is removed. "'Had Monsieur de Villefort any cause of personal dislike to you?' "'None. On the contrary, he was very kind to me.' I can, then, rely on the notes he has left concerning you? Entirely. That is well. Wait patiently, then. Dantes fell on his knees and prayed earnestly. The door closed, but this time a fresh inmate was left with Dantes. Hope. Will you see the register at once? asked the governor, or proceed to the other cell. "'Let us visit them all,' said the inspector. "'If I once went up those stairs, "'I should never have the courage to come down again. "'Ah, this one is not like the other, "'and his madness is less affecting "'than this one's display of reason. "'What is his folly? "'He fancies he possesses an immense treasure. "'The first year he offered government "'a million of francs for his release. "'The second, too, 
the third three, and so on progressively. He is now in his fifth year of captivity. He will ask to speak to you in private, and offer you five millions. How curious! What is his name? The Abbe Faria. Number 27, said the inspector. It is here. Unlock the door, Antoine. The turnkey obeyed, and the inspector gazed curiously into the chamber of the mad abbey. In the centre of the cell, in a circle traced with a fragment of plaster detached from the wall, sat a man whose tattered garments scarcely covered him. He was drawing in this circle geometrical lines, and seemed as much absorbed in his problem as Archimedes was when the soldier of Marcellus slew him. He did not move at the sound of the door, and continued his calculations, until the flash of the torches lighted up with an unwanted glare the sombre walls of his cell. Then, raising his head, he perceived with astonishment the number of persons present. He hastily seized the coverlet of his bed and wrapped it round him. "'What is it you want?' said the inspector. "'Hi, monsieur,' replied the abbey with an air of surprise. "'I want nothing.' "'You do not understand,' continued the inspector. "'I am sent here by government to visit the prison, "'and hear the requests of the prisoners.' "'Oh, that is different,' cried the abbey. "'And we shall understand each other, I hope.' "'There now,' whispered the governor. "'It is just as I told you.' "'Monsieur,' continued the prisoner, "'I am the abbey Ferrari, born at Rome. "'I was for twenty years Cardinal Spader's secretary. "'I was arrested, why I know not, "'toward the beginning of the year 1811. "'Since then I have demanded my liberty "'from the Italian and French government.' Why from the French government? Because I was arrested at Piombino, and I presume that, like Milan and Florence, Piombino has become the capital of some French department. Ah, said the inspector, you have not heard the latest news from Italy? My information dates from the day on which I was arrested, returned the Abbe Ferrara, and as the emperor had created the kingdom of Rome for his infant son, I presume that he has realized the dream of Machiavelli, and Caesar Borgia, which was to make Italy a united kingdom. Monsieur, returned the inspector, Providence has changed this gigantic plan you advocate so warmly. It is the only means of rendering Italy strong, happy, and independent. Very possibly, only I am not come to discuss politics, but to inquire if you have anything to ask or to complain of. The food is the same as in other prisons. That is very bad. The lodging is very unhealthful, but, on the whole, passable for a dungeon. And it is not that which I wish to speak of, but a secret I have to reveal of the greatest importance. We are coming to the point, whispered the governor. It is for that reason that I am delighted to see you, continued the abbey. Although you have disturbed me in a most important calculation, which, if it succeed, would possibly change Newton's system. Could you allow me a few words in private? What did I tell you? said the governor. You knew him, returned the inspector with a smile. What you ask is impossible, monsieur, continued he, addressing Ferraria. But, said the abbey, I would speak to you of a large sum amounting to five millions. The very sum you named, whispered the inspector in his turn. However, continued Ferraria, seeing that the inspector was about to depart, it is not absolutely necessary for us to be alone. The governor can be present. Unfortunately, said the governor, I know beforehand what you are about to say. It concerns your treasures, does it not? Ferraria fixed his eyes on him with an expression that would have convinced anyone else of his sanity. "'Of course,' said he, "'of what else should I speak?' "'Mr. Inspector,' continued the Governor, "'I can tell you the story as well as he, "'for it has been dined in my ears for the last four or five years.' "'That proves,' returned the Abbey, "'that you are like those of Holy Writ, "'who having ears hear not, and having eyes see not.' 
"'My dear sir, the government is rich and does not want your treasures,' replied the inspector. "'Keep them until you are liberated.' The abbey's eyes glistened. He seized the inspector's hand. "'But what if I am not liberated?' cried he. "'And am detained here until my death. This treasure will be lost. Had not government better profit by it? I will offer six millions, and I will content myself with the rest.' "'if they will only give me my liberty.' "'On my word,' said the inspector in a low tone, "'had I not been told beforehand that this man was mad, "'I should believe what he says.' "'I am not mad,' replied Ferraria, "'with the acuteness of hearing peculiar to prisoners. "'The treasure I speak of really exists, "'and I offer to sign an agreement with you, "'in which I promise to lead you to the spot where you shall dig.' "'And if I deceive you, bring me here again. "'I ask no more.' "'The governor laughed. "'Is the spot far from here?' "'A hundred leagues.' "'It is not ill-planned,' said the governor. "'If all the prisoners took it into their heads to travel a hundred leagues, "'and their guardians consented to accompany them, "'they would have a capital chance of escaping.' "'The scheme is well known,' said the inspector. "'and the abbey's plan has not even the merit of originality.' "'Then, turning to Ferraria, "'I inquired if you were well fed,' said he. "'Swear to me,' replied Ferraria, "'to free me if what I tell you prove true, "'and I will stay here while you go to the spot.' "'Are you well fed?' repeated the inspector. "'Monsieur, you run no risk, for, as I told you, I will stay here.' "'so there is no chance of my escaping.' "'You do not reply to my question,' replied the inspector impatiently. "'Nor you to mine,' cried the abbey. "'You will not accept my gold. I will keep it for myself. "'You refuse me my liberty. God will give it me.' "'And the abbey, casting away his coverlet, resumed his place and continued his calculations. "'What is he doing there?' said the inspector. "'Counting his treasures,' replied the governor. "'Ferrari replied to this sarcasm with a glance of profound contempt. "'The turnkey closed the door behind them. "'He was wealthy once, perhaps,' said the inspector. "'Or dreamed he was, and awoke mad. "'After all,' said the inspector, "'if he had been rich, he would not have been here.' "'So the matter ended for the Abbey Ferraria. He remained in his cell, and this visit only increased the belief of his insanity. Caligula or Nero, those treasure-seekers, those desirers of the impossible, would have accorded to the poor wretch, in exchange for his wealth, the liberty he so earnestly prayed for. But the kings of modern times, restrained by the limits of mere probability, have neither courage nor desire. They fear the ear that hears their orders, and the eye that scrutinizes their actions. Formerly they believed themselves sprung from Jupiter, and shielded by their birth, but nowadays they are not invaluable. It has always been against the policy of despotic governments to suffer the victims of their persecutions to reappear. As the Inquisition rarely allowed its victims to be seen with their limbs distorted and their flesh lacerated by torture, so madness is always concealed in its cell. From whence, should it depart, it is conveyed to some gloomy hospital, where the doctor has no thought for man or mind in the mutilated being the jailer delivers to him. The very madness of the Abbey Ferraria, gone mad in prison, condemned him to the perpetual captivity. The inspector kept his word with Dantes, he examined the register, and found the following note concerning him. Edmund Dantes, violent Bonapartist, took an active part in the return from Elba. The greatest watchfulness and care to be exercised. This note was in a different hand from the rest, which showed that it had been added since his confinement. The inspector could not contend against this accusation. He simply wrote, Nothing to be done. This visit had infused new vigour into Dantes. He had, till then, forgotten the date. 
but now, with a fragment of plaster, he wrote the date, 30th of July, 1816, and made a mark every day, in order not to lose his reckoning again. Days and weeks passed away, then months. Dantes still waited. He at first expected to be freed in a fortnight. This fortnight expired. He decided that the inspector would do nothing until his return to Paris, and that he would not reach there until his circuit was finished. He therefore fixed three months. Three months passed away, then six more. Finally ten months and a half had gone by, and no favourable change had taken place. And Dantes began to fancy the inspector's visit but a dream, an illusion of the brain. At the expiration of a year, the governor was transferred. He had obtained charge of the fortress at Ham. He took with him several of his subordinates, and amongst them Dantes' jailer. A new governor arrived. It would have been too tedious to acquire the names of the prisoners. He learned their numbers instead. This horrible place contained fifty cells. Their inhabitants were designated by the numbers of their cell, and the unhappy young man was no longer called Edmond Dantes. He was now number thirty-four. End of chapter fourteen. Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter fifteen. Number thirty-four and number twenty-seven. Dante passed through all the stages of torture natural to prisoners in suspense. He was sustained at first by that pride of conscious innocence which is the sequence to hope. Then he began to doubt his own innocence, which justified in some measure the governor's belief in his mental alienation. And then, relaxing his sentiment of pride, he addressed his supplications not to God, but to man. God is always the last resource. Unfortunates, who ought to begin with God, do not have any hope in him till they have exhausted all other means of deliverance. Dante asked to be removed from his present dungeon into another, for a change, however disadvantageous, was still a change, and would afford him some amusement. He entreated to be allowed to walk about, to have fresh air, books, and writing materials. His requests were not granted, but he went on asking all the same. He accustomed himself to speaking to the new jailer, although the latter was, if possible, more taciturn than the old one. But still, to speak to a man, even though mute, was something. Dante spoke for the sake of hearing his own voice. He had tried to speak when alone, but the sound of his voice terrified him. Often before his captivity, Dante's mind had revolted at the idea of assemblages of prisoners made up of thieves, vagabonds, and murderers. He now wished to be amongst them, in order to see some other face besides that of his jailer. He sighed for the galleys with the infamous costume, the chain, and the brand on the shoulder. The galley slaves breathed the fresh air of heaven and saw each other. They were very happy. He besought the jailer one day to let him have a companion, were it even the mad abbey. The jailer, though rough and hardened by the constant sight of so much suffering, was yet a man. At the bottom of his heart he had often had a feeling of pity for this unhappy young man who suffered so, and he laid the request of number thirty-four before the governor. But the latter sapiently imagined that Dante wished to conspire or attempt an escape, and refused his request. Dante had exhausted all human resources, and he then turned to God. All the pious ideas that had been so long forgotten returned. He recollected the prayers his mother had taught him, and discovered a new meaning in every word. For in prosperity prayers seem but a mere medley of words, until misfortune comes, and the unhappy sufferer first understands the meaning of the sublime language in which he invokes the pity of heaven. He prayed and prayed aloud, no longer terrified at the sound of his own voice, for he fell into a sort of ecstasy. He laid every action of his life before the Almighty, proposed tasks to accomplish, and at the end of every prayer introduced the entreaty oftener addressed to man than to God, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Yet, in spite of his earnest prayers, Dante remained a prisoner. Then gloom settled heavily upon him. 
Dante was a man of great simplicity of thought, and without education. He could not, therefore, in the solitude of his dungeon, traverse in mental vision the history of the ages, bring to life the nations that had perished, and rebuild the ancient cities so vast and stupendous in the light of the imagination, and the past before the eye glowing with celestial colors in Martin's Babylonian pictures. He could not do this. He, whose past life was so short, whose present so melancholy, and his future so doubtful. Nineteen years of light to reflect upon in eternal darkness. No distraction could come to his aid. His energetic spirit, that would have exulted in thus revisiting the past, was imprisoned like an eagle in a cage. He clung to one idea, that of his happiness destroyed without apparent cause by an unheard-of fatality. He considered and reconsidered this idea, devoured it, so to speak, as the implacable Ugolino devours the skull of Archbishop Roger in the Inferno of Dante. Rage supplanted religious fervor. Dante uttered blasphemies that made his jailer recoil with horror, dashed himself furiously against the walls of his prison, wreaked his anger upon everything, and chiefly upon himself, so that the least thing, a grain of sand, a straw, or a breath of air that annoyed him, led to paroxysms of fury. Then the letter that Villefort had showed to him recurred to his mind, and every line gleamed forth in fiery letters on the wall like the many tekel ufarsen of Belshazzar. He told himself that it was the enmity of man, and not the vengeance of heaven, that had thus plunged him into the deepest misery. He consigned his unknown persecutors to the most horrible tortures he could imagine, and found them all insufficient, because after torture came death and after death, if not repose, at least the boon of unconsciousness. By dint of constantly dwelling on the idea that tranquillity was death, and if punishment were the end in view, other tortures than death must be invented, he began to reflect on suicide. Unhappy he who, on the brink of misfortune, broods over ideas like these. Before him is a dead sea that stretches in azure calm before the eye, but he who unwarily ventures within its embrace finds himself struggling with a monster that would drag him down to perdition. Once thus ensnared, unless the protecting hand of God snatch him thence, all is over, and his struggles but tend to hasten his destruction. This state of mental anguish is, however, less terrible than the sufferings that proceed or the punishment that possibly will follow." there is a sort of consolation at the contemplation of the yawning abyss, at the bottom of which lie darkness and obscurity. Edmund found some solace in these ideas. All his sorrows, all his sufferings, with their train of gloomy spectres, fled from his cell when the angel of death seemed about to enter. Dante reviewed his past life with composure, and, looking forward with terror to his future existence, chose that middle line that seemed to afford him a refuge. Sometimes, said he, in my voyages, when I was a man and commanded other men, I have seen the heavens overcast, the sea rage and foam, the storm arise, and like a monstrous bird beating the two horizons with its wings. Then I felt that my vessel was a vain refuge that trembled and shook before the tempest. Soon the fury of the waves and the sight of the sharp rocks announced the approach of death, and death then terrified me, and I used all my skill and intelligence as a man and a sailor to struggle against the wrath of God. But I did so because I was happy, because I had not courted death, because to be cast upon a bed of rocks and seaweed seemed terrible, because I was unwilling that I, a creature made for the service of God, should serve for food to the gulls and ravens. But now it is different. I have lost all that bound me to life. Death smiles and invites me to repose. I die after my own manner. I die exhausted and broken-spirited, as I fall asleep when I have paced three thousand times round my cell." No sooner had this idea taken possession of him than he became more composed, arranged his couch to the best of his power, ate little and slept less, and found existence almost supportable, because he felt that he could throw it off at pleasure like a worn-out garment. 
Two methods of self-destruction were at his disposal. He could hang himself with his handkerchief to the window bars, or refuse food and die of starvation. But the first was repugnant to him. Dante has always entertained the greatest horror of pirates who are hung up to the yard-arm. He would not die by what seemed an infamous death. He resolved to adopt the second, and began that day to carry out his resolve. Nearly four years had passed away. At the end of the second he had ceased to mark the lapse of time. Dante said, I wish to die, and had chosen the manner of his death, and fearful of changing his mind he had taken an oath to die. When my morning and evening meals are brought, thought he, I will cast them out of the window, and they will think that I have eaten them. He kept his word. Twice a day he cast out, through the barred aperture, the provisions his jailer brought him, at first gaily, then with deliberation, and at last with regret. Nothing but the recollection of his oath gave him strength to proceed. Hunger made viands once repugnant, now acceptable. He held the plate in his hand for an hour at a time, and gazed thoughtfully at the morsel of bad meat, of tainted fish, of black and moldy bread. It was the last yearning for life, contending with the resolution of despair. Then his dungeon seemed less somber, his prospects less desperate. He was still young, he was only four or five and twenty, he had nearly fifty years to live. What unforeseen events might not open his prison door and restore him to liberty? Then he raised to his lips the repast that, like a voluntary tantalus, he refused himself. But he thought of his oath, and he would not break it. He persisted until, at last, he had not sufficient strength to rise and cast his supper out of the loophole. The next morning he could not see or hear. The jailer feared he was dangerously ill. Edmund hoped he was dying. Thus the day passed away. Edmund felt a sort of stupor creeping over him, which brought with it a feeling almost of content. The gnawing pain at his stomach had ceased. His thirst had abated. When he closed his eyes he saw myriads of lights dancing before them like the will-o'-the-wisps that play about the marshes. It was the twilight of that mysterious country called death. Suddenly, about nine o'clock in the evening, Edmund heard a hollow sound in the wall against which he was lying. So many loathsome animals inhabited the prison that their noise did not, in general, awake him. But whether abstinence had quickened his faculties, or whether the noise was really louder than usual, Edmund raised his head and listened. It was a continual scratching, as if made by a huge claw, a powerful tooth, or some iron instrument attacking the stones. Although weakened, the young man's brain instantly responded to the idea that haunts all prisoners, liberty. It seemed to him that heaven had at length taken pity on him, and had sent this noise to warn him on the very brink of the abyss. Perhaps one of those beloved ones he had so often thought of was thinking of him, and striving to diminish the distance that separated them. No, no, doubtless he was deceived, and it was but one of those dreams that forerun death. Edmund still heard the sound. It lasted nearly three hours. He then heard a noise of something falling, and all was silent. Some hours afterwards it began again, nearer and more distinct. Edmund was intensely interested. Suddenly the jailer entered. For a week since he had resolved to die, and during the four days that he had been carrying out his purpose, Edmund had not spoken to the attendant, had not answered him when he inquired what was the matter with him, and turned his face to the wall when he looked too curiously at him. But now the jailer might hear the noise and put an end to it, and so destroy a ray of something like hope that soothed his last moments. The jailer brought him his breakfast. Dante raised himself up, and began to talk about everything, about the bad quality of the food, about the coldness of his dungeon, grumbling and complaining, in order to have an excuse for speaking louder, and wearying the patience of his jailer, who out of kindness of heart had brought broth and white bread for his prisoner. Fortunately, he fancied that Dante was delirious, and placing the food on the rickety table he withdrew. 
Edmund listened, and the sound became more and more distinct. "'There can be no doubt about it,' thought he. "'It is some prisoner who is striving to obtain his freedom. Oh, if I were only there to help him!' Suddenly another idea took possession of his mind, so used to misfortune that it was scarcely capable of hope. The idea that the noise was made by workmen the governor had ordered to repair the neighboring dungeon. It was easy to ascertain this, but how could he risk the question? It was easy to call his jailer's attention to the noise, and watch his countenance as he listened, but might he not by this means destroy hopes far more important than the short-lived satisfaction of his own curiosity? Unfortunately, Edmund's brain was still so feeble that he could not bend his thoughts to anything in particular. He saw but one means of restoring lucidity and clearness to his judgment. He turned his eyes towards the soup which the jailer had brought, rose, staggered towards it, raised the vessel to his lips, and drank off the contents with a feeling of indescribable pleasure. He had often heard that shipwrecked persons had died through having eagerly devoured too much food. Edmund replaced on the table the bread he was about to devour, and returned to his couch. He did not wish to die. He soon felt that his ideas became again collected. He could think, and strengthen his thoughts by reasoning. Then he said to himself, "'I must put this to the test, but without compromising anybody.' If it is a workman, I need but knock against the wall, and he will cease to work, in order to find out who is knocking, and why he does so. But as his occupation is sanctioned by the governor, he will soon resume it. If, on the contrary, it is a prisoner, the noise I make will alarm him. He will cease, and not begin again, until he thinks every one is asleep. Edmund rose again, but this time his legs did not tremble, and his sight was clear. He went to a corner of his dungeon, detached a stone, and with it knocked against the wall where the sound came. He struck thrice. At the first blow the sound ceased, as if by magic. Edmund listened intently. An hour passed. Two hours passed. And no sound was heard from the wall. All was silent there. Full of hope, Edmund swallowed a few mouthfuls of bread and water, and, thanks to the vigor of his constitution, found himself well-nigh recovered. The day passed away in utter silence. Night came without recurrence of the noise. "'It is a prisoner,' said Edmund joyfully. The night passed in perfect silence. Edmund did not close his eyes. In the morning the jailer brought him fresh provisions. He had already devoured those of the previous day. He ate these, listening anxiously for the sound, walking round and round his cell, shaking the iron bars of the loophole, restoring vigor and agility to his limbs by exercise, and so preparing himself for his future destiny. At intervals he listened to learn if the noise had not begun again, and grew impatient at the prudence of the prisoner, who did not guess he had been disturbed by a captive as anxious for liberty as himself. Three days passed, seventy-two long, tedious hours, which he counted off by minutes. At length, one evening, as the jailer was visiting him for the last time that night, Dante, with his ear for the hundredth time at the wall, fancied he heard an almost imperceptible movement among the stones. He moved away, walked up and down his cell to collect his thoughts, and then went back and listened. The matter was no longer doubtful. Something was at work on the other side of the wall. The prisoner had discovered the danger, and had substituted a lever for a chisel. Encouraged by this discovery, Edmund determined to assist the indefatigable laborer. He began by moving his bed, and looked around for anything with which he could pierce the wall, penetrate the moist cement, and displace a stone. He saw nothing. He had no knife or sharp instrument. The window grating was of iron, but he had too often assured himself of its solidity. All his furniture consisted of a bed, a chair, a table, a pail, and a jug. The bed had iron clamps, but they were screwed to the wood, and it would have required a screwdriver to take them off. The table and chair had nothing. The pail had once possessed a handle, but that had been removed. Dante had but one resource, which was to break the jug, and with one of the sharp fragments attack the wall. 
he let the jug fall on the floor, and it broke in pieces. Dante concealed two or three of the sharpest fragments in his bed, leaving the rest on the floor. The breaking of his jug was too natural an accident to excite suspicion. Edmund had all the night to work in, but in the darkness he could not do much, and he soon felt that he was working against something very hard. He pushed back his bed and waited for day. All night he heard the subterranean workmen, who continued to mine his way. Day came. The jailer entered. Dante told him that the jug had fallen from his hands while he was drinking, and the jailer went grumblingly to fetch another, without giving himself the trouble to remove the fragments of the broken one. He returned speedily, advised the prisoner to be more careful, and departed. Dante heard joyfully the key grate in the lock. He listened until the sound of steps died away, and then, hastily displacing his bed, saw by the faint light that penetrated into his cell that he had labored uselessly the previous evening in attacking the stone instead of removing the plaster that surrounded it. The damp had rendered it friable, and Dante was able to break it off, in small morsels, it is true, but at the end of half an hour he had scraped off a handful. A mathematician might have calculated that in two years, supposing that the rock was not encountered, a passage twenty feet long and two feet broad might be formed. The prisoner reproached himself with not having thus employed the hours he had passed in vain hopes, prayer, and despondency. During the six years that he had been imprisoned, what might he not have accomplished? In three days he had succeeded, with the utmost precaution, in removing the cement and exposing the stonework. The wall was built of rough stones, among which, to give strength to the structure, blocks of hewn stone were at intervals embedded. It was one of these he had uncovered, and which he must remove from its socket. Dante strove to do this with his nails, but they were too weak. The fragments of the jug broke, and after an hour of useless toil he paused. Was he to be thus stopped at the beginning, and was he to wait inactive until his fellow workmen had completed his task? Suddenly an idea occurred to him. He smiled, and the perspiration dried on his forehead. The jailer always brought Dante's soup in an iron saucepan. This saucepan contained soup for both prisoners, for Dante had noticed that it was either quite full or half empty, according as the turnkey gave it to him or to his companion first. The handle of the saucepan was of iron. Dante would have given ten years of his life in exchange for it. The jailer was accustomed to pour the contents of the saucepan into Dante's plate, and Dante, after eating his soup with a wooden spoon, washed the plate, which thus served for every day. Now, when evening came, Dante put his plate on the ground near the door. The jailer, as he entered, stepped on it and broke it. This time he could not blame Dante. He was wrong to leave it there, but the jailer was wrong not to have looked before him. The jailer, therefore, only grumbled. Then he looked about for something to pour the soup into. Dante's entire dinner service consisted of one plate. There was no alternative. "'Leave the saucepan,' said Dante. "'You can take it away when you bring me my breakfast.' This advice was to the jailer's taste, as it spared him the necessity of making another trip. He left the saucepan. Dante was beside himself with joy. He rapidly devoured his food, and after waiting an hour, lest the jailer should change his mind in return, he removed his bed, took the handle of the saucepan, inserted the point between the hewn stone and rough stones of the wall, and employed it as a lever. A slight oscillation showed Dante that all went well. At the end of an hour the stone was extricated from the wall, leaving a cavity a foot and a half in diameter. Dante carefully collected the plaster, carried it into the corner of his cell, and covered it with earth. Then, wishing to make the best use of his time while he had the means of labor, he continued to work without ceasing. At the dawn of day he replaced the stone, pushed his bed against the wall, and lay down. The breakfast consisted of a piece of bread. The jailer entered and placed the bread on the table. "'Well, don't you intend to bring me another plate?' said Dante. No, replied the turnkey, you destroy everything. First you break your jug, then you make me break your plate. If all the prisoners followed your example, the government would be ruined. I shall leave you the saucepan and pour your soup into that. So for the future, I hope you will not be so destructive. 
Dante raised his eyes to heaven and clasped his hands beneath the coverlet. He felt more gratitude for the possession of this piece of iron than he had ever felt for anything. He had noticed, however, that the prisoner on the other side had ceased to labor. No matter, this was a greater reason for proceeding. If his neighbor would not come to him, he would go to his neighbor. All day he toiled on untiringly, and by the evening he had succeeded in extracting ten handfuls of plaster and fragments of stone. When the hour for his jailer's visit arrived, Dante straightened the handle of the saucepan as well as he could, and placed it in its accustomed place. The turnkey poured his ration of soup into it, together with the fish, for thrice a week the prisoners were deprived of meat. This would have been a method of reckoning time, had not Dante long ceased to do so. Having poured out the soup, the turnkey retired. Dante wished to ascertain whether his neighbor had really ceased to work. He listened. All was silent, as it had been for the last three days. Dante sighed. It was evident that his neighbor distrusted him. However, he toiled on all the night without being discouraged, but after two or three hours he encountered an obstacle. The iron made no impression, but met with a smooth surface. Dante touched it, and found that it was a beam. This beam crossed, or rather blocked up, the hole Dante has made. It was necessary, therefore, to dig above or under it. The unhappy young man had not thought of this. "'Oh, my God, my God!' murmured he. "'I have so earnestly prayed to you that I hoped my prayers had been heard.' after having deprived me of my liberty after having deprived me of death after having recalled me to existence my god have pity on me and do not let me die in despair who talks of god and despair at the same time said a voice that seemed to come from beneath the earth and deadened by the distance sounded hollow and sepulchral in the young man's ears edmund's hair stood on end and he rose to his knees ah said he I hear a human voice. Edmund had not heard any one speak save his jailer for four or five years, and a jailer is no man to a prisoner. He is a living door, a barrier of flesh and blood, adding strength to restraints of oak and iron. In the name of heaven, cried Dante, speak again, though the sound of your voice terrifies me. Who are you? Who are you? said the voice. "'An unhappy prisoner,' replied Dante, who made no hesitation in answering. "'Of what country?' "'A Frenchman.' "'Your name?' "'Edmund Dante.' "'Your profession?' "'A sailor.' "'How long have you been here?' "'Since the 28th of February, 1815.' "'Your crime?' "'I am innocent. "'But of what are you accused? "'Of having conspired to aid the Emperor's return.' "'What?' for the emperor's return the emperor is no longer on the throne then he abdicated at fontainebleau in 1814 and was sent to the island of elba but how long have you been here that you are ignorant of all this since 1811 dante shuddered this man had been four years longer than himself in prison do not dig any more said the voice only tell me how high up is your excavation on a level with the floor how is it concealed behind my bed has your bed been moved since you have been a prisoner no what does your chamber open on a corridor and the corridor on a court alas murmured the voice oh what is the matter cried dante i have made a mistake owing to an error in my plans i took the wrong angle and have come out fifteen feet from where i intended I took the wall you are mining for the outer wall of the fortress. But then you would be close to the sea. That is what I hoped. And supposing you had succeeded? I should have thrown myself into the sea, gained one of the islands near here, the Isle de Dom or the Isle de Tipulin, and then I should have been safe. Could you have swum so far? Heaven would have given me strength, but now all is lost. All? Yes stop up your excavation carefully do not work any more and wait until you hear from me tell me at least who you are i am i am number twenty seven you mistrust me then said dante edmund fancied he heard a bitter laugh resounding from the depths oh i am a christian cried dante guessing instinctively that this man meant to abandon him 
I swear to you by him who died for us that naught shall induce me to breathe one syllable to my jailers, but I conjure you, do not abandon me. If you do, I swear to you, for I have got to the end of my strength, that I will dash my brains out against the wall, and you will have my death to reproach yourself with. How old are you? Your voice is that of a young man. I do not know my age, for I have not counted the years I have been here. All I do know is that I was just nineteen when I was arrested, the 28th of February, 1815. Not quite twenty-six, murmured the voice. At that age he could not be a traitor. Oh, no, no, cried Dante. I swear to you again, rather than betray you, I would allow myself to be hacked in pieces. You have done well to speak to me and ask for my assistance, for I was about to form another plan and leave you, but your age reassures me. I will not forget you. Wait. How long? I must calculate our chances. I will give you the signal. But you will not leave me. You will come to me, or you will let me come to you. We will escape, and if we cannot escape, we will talk. You of those whom you love, and I of those whom I love. You must love somebody. No, I am alone in the world. Then you will love me. If you are young, I will be your comrade. If you are old, I will be your son. I have a father who is seventy if he yet lives. I only love him and a young girl called Mercedes. My father has not yet forgotten me, I am sure, but God alone knows if she loves me still. I shall love you as I loved my father. It is well, returned the voice, to-morrow. These few words were uttered with an accent that left no doubt of his sincerity. Dante rose, dispersed the fragments with the same precaution as before, and pushed his bed back against the wall. He then gave himself up to his happiness. He would no longer be alone. He was, perhaps, about to regain his liberty. At the worst, he would have a companion, and captivity that is shared is but half captivity. Plaints made in common are almost prayers, and prayers where two or three are gathered together invoke the mercy of heaven. All day Dante walked up and down his cell. He sat down occasionally on his bed, pressing his hand on his heart. At the slightest noise he bounded towards the door. Once or twice the thought crossed his mind that he might be separated from this unknown, whom he loved already, and then his mind was made up. When the jailer moved his bed and stooped to examine the opening, he would kill him with his water jug. He would be condemned to die, but he was about to die of grief and despair when this miraculous noise recalled him to life. The jailer came in the evening. Dante was on his bed. It seemed to him that thus he better guarded the unfinished opening. Doubtless there was a strange expression in his eyes, for the jailer said, "'Come, are you going mad again?' Dante did not answer. He feared that the emotion of his voice would betray him. The jailer went away, shaking his head. Night came. Dante hoped that his neighbor would profit by the silence to address him, but he was mistaken. The next morning, however, just as he removed his bed from the wall, he heard three knocks. He threw himself on his knees. "'Is it you?' said he. "'I am here.' "'Is your jailer gone?' "'Yes,' said Dante. "'He will not return until the evening, so that we have twelve hours before us.' "'I can work, then,' said the voice. "'Oh, yes, yes, this instant I entreat you.' In a moment that part of the floor on which Dante was resting his two hands, as he knelt with his head in the opening, suddenly gave way. He drew back smartly, while a mass of stones and earth disappeared in a hole that opened beneath the aperture he himself had formed. Then from the bottom of this passage, the depth of which it was impossible to measure, he saw appear, first the head, then the shoulders, and lastly the body of a man who sprang lightly into his cell. End of chapter 15. Thank you for listening to the audiobook on at Audiobook Avenue. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on new releases.